Uh, this would be vapor, water vapor. And uh, this would be liquid. And the thing that uh, I want to uh, point out on this diagram is this uh, interesting uh, endpoint here, sometimes also called uh, a critical point. Um, so we know that water and vapor are different, right? We can swim in water, but in vapor we cannot swim. Uh, and and they, they apparently have different properties. And indeed, under normal conditions, when you go from liquid to, uh, to, to vapor, there would be a phase transition. Um, however, um, this is not really uh, necessary because if, if you go between these two same points, if you go straight down by, say, changing pressure like this, then you encounter a phase transition. However, you could as well uh, go like this around this critical point and then your path is completely smooth. There would be no phase transition, namely your free energy and all of its derivatives would remain uh, completely smooth. On the other hand, and here's uh, the other question, um, so how about between, say, ice and liquid or ice and vapor? Uh, is that also the case? Clearly, if I go like this, there's a phase transition. If I go like this, there's a phase transition. But can I go somehow around this and, uh, and, and, and transform ice to uh, vapor without really encountering any singularity in uh, the free energy of the system? Anybody uh, would like to venture a, a guess or an answer? No. No, this is not possible. Um, so basically, this line here never ends. It, it kind of goes and goes and goes. And, and, and well, no matter how high the pressure, the, 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 transition, the, the transition is always there. So what do you think is the reason for that? Why can we go between liquid and uh, gas without a phase transition, but it's not possible to go between solid and uh, liquid without a phase transition. Somebody said symmetry, and that's exactly the answer. So uh, liquid and vapor have the same symmetries, right? They, liquid and vapor, if you look at them, there's no order. That, they have the same symmetries as the empty space. They have all the translation, rotation symmetries, and therefore there's no symmetry distinction between those two phases. So although in some region of phase diagram there is a phase transition, uh, in, in general there need not be a phase transition because there's no sharp distinction between them. And indeed, according to a more general classification, we would uh, ascribe them into the same phase because they can be connected without encountering a phase transition. On the other hand, ice, which is a solid, has broken all sorts of symmetries. For instance, in, in a, it, it, it forms a crystalline lattice, so translational symmetry is broken, so is rotation, and, and other symmetries can be broken. And this is a, a fundamental idea in a more modern view of uh, condensed matter physics, that allows us to classify phases of matter. Classify phases of matter according to symmetry. And this idea goes back to Landau. He was the first to formulate this in uh, the 50s of the last century. And basically what he said is that uh, all phases of matter can be uniquely classified by enumerating their symmetries. And the two phases from this standpoint are the same when they have the same symmetry and different when they differ in, in some of their symmetries. And uh, necessarily when you have two phases with different symmetries, necessarily you have a phase transition that uh, uh, wh when you go between them, no matter what is the path in the phase space you take, there necessarily has to be 
a singularity in the free energy or some of its derivatives. And uh, up until the 80s of the last century, this was thought to be an exhaustive classification of all phases of matter. Okay? And this was pretty satisfactory uh, state of matter, state of uh, 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 condensed matter physics, because we thought we can classify everything according to this paradigm, and, uh, and, and everything is good. What did I write here? I meant Landau. Okay, sorry. Now, in the uh, 1980s, however, uh, a, a wrinkle on this classification appeared, which eventually led to the concept of topological phases. So in topological phases, you can have a situation when the two systems have exactly the same symmetries. There is no symmetry distinction. Nevertheless, um, they are distinct because of their internal topology. And you cannot go from one to another without encountering the phase transition because of this. So this uh, pertains to phases that are the same according to Landau or according to symmetry rather. I'm sure Landau, if he was alive, he would agree with this. So I, I, I just say according to symmetry, but distinct <coughs> because of topology. And this is what I want to explain to you. Um, the standard examples of topological phases, let me just list them. Examples of topo phases are a quantum Hall effect Uh, both integer and fractional, and I will not discuss really those because we would need more time to really go into detail. Uh, topological insulators. So this is uh, 1986 quantum Hall effect. Uh, I mean, the, the, the yeah, fractional quantum Hall effect. Topological insulators, let's say 2006 <clears throat> or, or thereabouts. And there's another example which uh, is uh, kind of conventionally thought of as a symmetry broken phase, but in reality, according to this modern understanding, should also be understood as a topological phase, which is superconductors. And superconductors, of course, have been discovered back in 1911, so uh, it's probably the, the oldest uh, of all uh, topological phases. And for many years, they were thought as just one of the symmetry uh, broken phases. But it turns out the symmetry that is broken in a superconductor is the gauge symmetry. And there are theorems which tell you that, in fact, gauge theory cannot really be broken. So there, there's always been this contradiction and how you precisely define a superconductor in this Landau scheme. And, and then it's been actually shown quite decisively that superconductors should actually be viewed as topologically ordered rather than symmetry broken phases. Yes? When was that shown? Uh, this was shown also in early 2000s. I can give you a reference. And this is not something that is, uh, I would say, universally accepted, but it's accepted among people who care about this. <laughs> Um, I, it's not clear whether it has any, any um, uh, practical effect. I mean, whether we understand superconductor as a broken symmetry phase or a topological phase doesn't seem to have much bearing <clears throat> on our understanding of actual materials, but 
as a conceptual issue, I think it's been now resolved that we should count superconductors in, in this uh, category rather than ordinary symmetry broken phases like crystals or magnets and so on. OK, so any other questions? So regarding topological insulators, uh, was this first discovered experimentally? Topological insulators were first predicted theoretically uh, and then discovered experimentally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the first uh, discussion, theoretical discussion, is 2005, and then 2006, first uh, experimental uh, papers have appeared. Yeah. Uh, also, the talk of like a class of topological superconductors, is that a separate thing again? Yeah. So I, I don't really list topological superconductors here, which should be there, but we don't really have um, good experimental examples. So let, let, let me put this uh, here kind of in parentheses. Topological superconductors. So all superconductors should be understood as, uh, as topological phases, but and again, this is not something I will have time to go into in this course. There are some superconductors that are more topological than others. Let me put it that way. And if it sounds like a weird thing, then I encourage you to learn about this more, and I can give you some references. OK, so what is this? Uh, uh, what are these topological phases? Here are some examples. And let me give you a kind of more um, fundamental definition. Um, let me write it like this. When uh, certain physical quantities or physical properties of a system <coughs> depend on global topology, global topology, and uh, not on uh, local details, such as disorder, then the system is said to realize a topological phase. <coughs> so an example of this uh, physical property that depends on uh, global topology and not on local details in quantum hall states is uh, whole conductance, which is precisely quantized. In topological insulators, it's the existence of uh, gapless surface states. In superconductors, it's flux quantization. And in topological superconductors is appearance of some fractionalized excitations. Yes, question. Yeah, I, I would like to ask about the precise definition of topology in this whole business, because this is very important. Mm -hmm. when we say topology, what do we mean by, by this word? Topology is uh, meant here in a general sense as something that you know, precisely does not depend on local details. And I, I, I will give examples of this. And uh, <coughs> um, you will see that in each case, topology plays a somewhat different role. But in all those cases, it's, it's key that uh, uh, we have uh, uh, some topological property of a system. Yes? This is specifically not interactions. Um, well, so this is not specific to non-interacting systems. For instance, fractional quantum hall states uh, are, depend on strong interactions. Superconductors also, uh, ex their existence depends on, on interactions. <coughs> 
topological insulators can be understood without uh, appealing to interactions. That's true. But again, this is uh, kind of general. So let me start by giving you a, a very simple mathematical or geometrical example of a topological invariant. So in each of these cases, there's something called a topological invariant, and the physical quantity depends only on that topological invariant. And by just by its name, when something is invariant, that means it doesn't change, right? Topological invariant means that something is a constant unless you change the topology of the system. So let, let me give you an example because this is best understood on examples. So this is geometrical example of a topological invariant. And when you studied uh, mathematics, maybe you heard about the Gauss-Bonnet theorem. So the Gauss-Bonnet theorem um, says the following. When I take an integral over a closed surface in three dimensions of the following quantity that I will define in a moment, I get uh, 4 pi times 1 minus g. So this, this kappa here <coughs> is the so-called Gaussian curvature. Kappa is equal to 1 over R1 times R2, and it's the so-called Gaussian curvature. <clears throat> and this G here is the genus of the surface, colloquially also known as the number of holes. So basically, Gauss-Bonnet theorem, and this is a simple version of Gauss-Bonnet theorem that applies to closed surfaces. There is also a, a, an extended version that applies to surfaces that are open, but uh, this is all that we need for today's purposes. So it says that when you integrate this Gaussian curvature <coughs> over the surface uh, in three dimensions, the result is always 4 pi times 1 minus g where g is an integer called genus and represents number of holes in the surface. Okay, So uh, let, let me uh, just tell you what this is. Uh, R1 and R2 are the so-called uh, principal curvatures. And are defined like this. And I, you know, I don't really know how to draw, so forgive me uh, for this. So, so this is an element of a surface that has a, a normal vector n like this. And principal curvature is defined as follows. You uh, simply take all two-dimensional planes that uh, uh, in which this uh, one dimension in, in which this uh, um, normal vector lies, and an intersection of your surface and uh, uh, the, this plane is then uh, a two dimension, sorry, one dimensional curve like this, which close to the point can be approximated by a circle. Okay? Now you define a radius of this circle as r, and then the two principal curvatures are defined as minimal and maximal radius that you can get by considering all these different planes. Okay, so R1 is a minimum of all these Rs, whereas R2 is maximum of all, all those Rs. So those are the principal curvatures. 
And one over their product is, is called Gaussian curvature. And this is when you, the theorem says that when you integrate this over the surface, you get something that is 4 pi times an integer. And let's check that. So let, let, let's, let's try sphere. <coughs> and for the sphere, of course, there's only one curvature, which is the radius, right? And uh, so if we, if we do this integral, then uh, we just get 1 over the radius squared, because r1 is equal to r2 in this case. Uh, and uh, when we integrate this over the whole surface, this, of course, is a constant. So we get uh, 4 pi over r squared times r squared. And this r squared cancels. So uh, we get 4 pi. And this indeed agrees with the fact that a sphere is a surface <coughs> of genus 0. Um, and indeed, surface sphere has no holes. Um, one could do the next thing that one could do, of course, is uh, a, uh, a torus. Now here, the explicit calculation, we would have to uh, do some work, actually. But you would find that, uh, indeed, uh, integral of uh, kappa dA is equal to 0, consistent with the fact that uh, torus has a genus g equals 1. It has one hole, and so on and so forth. Now, the, what's important about this is not the details. The important thing is that some quantity here that is, you, naively, you would have, think that, you would have thought that um, if you locally change this, if you squish this sphere, for instance, and, and make it into some sort of ovoid, then uh, this integral naively should change. But this theorem tells you that no, it does not. It always, as long as you don't tear anything, you, you, you can make arbitrary deformation of your sphere as long as it's a smooth deformation, then this, in, or this integral will remain equal to 4 pi. Yes? So are those properties really like a microscopic properties in the common sense? Like if, if I have like some, some, let's say, solid, which is like in spherical shape or like a torus shape, or is it like more profound thing like that's so, so this is an example <laughs> of, um, uh, oh, like, of of a topological invariant in geometry, oh, right? In, in in physics, this is not going to be very important. <clears throat> okay. But we will have similar. The, the important lesson here is that there are similar quantities in those systems where um, some measurable quantity depends on some integral over something that is insensitive to local deformations. Just like I can take this sphere and deform it any which way I want, as long as I don't puncture holes. And this integral will be exactly the same, and same for the torus and any other higher genus object. OK? Can you, this is like explicitly two-dimensional stuff that's embedded in three-dimensional space. That's the gauss bonnet theorem, yeah. Yeah, so you, can you extend this to high dimensions? I'm not sure. Uh, I'm, I'm not a mathematician. I'm, I'm, I, I know about the extension of to, to objects where you know th there is it's 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 not a, an open surface. It, it's an open surface, and then on the left hand side you add a line integral over any sort of hole that you have, and then this still is valid. But we don't really it's not really useful for us here. Okay, so in physics these topological phases almost always. Something like this happens, that you can associate a physical quantity, such as Hall conductance in a quantum Hall system, with some, uh, some integral over, say, a Brillouin zone that you can show is equal to some constant times integer. And this does not change when you change things uh, only smoothly. Right? You have to do something equivalent to going from a sphere to a torus to change that quantity, and therefore, over, over a range of, uh, uh, of uh, parameters, that uh, quantity <coughs> will be robust in physics. So let's, uh, let's uh, uh, give some examples of this. And uh, what I will do 
I will uh, first give uh, a, a general introduction to this, and then I will uh, give you a one-dimensional example of a topological insulator, which does not quite exist in practice, but it's easy to understand theoretically. And uh, then we move on to graphene, which um, also isn't quite a topological insulator, but uh, it is uh, in some sense that I will define in, um, in, in as we go. Now there are, like I said, real topological phases. Unfortunately, their detailed description would require more, more time than, than we actually have. So um, <clears throat> let me now start from the uh, something called topological band theory. And, and this, this, this follows directly from the ideas that we were exploring last week about electrons and periodic potential. Um, so I will start from the Bloch equation. which can be written like this, H of K is acting on just the periodic part of uh, of the wave function. So this U and K is the periodic part of the wave function. I write the full wave function psi and k as e to the i k dot r times u n of k, where psi is a subject of the Schrodinger equation with the full Hamiltonian with periodic potential. And then when we uh, put in this form, we can write just this uh, a block equation for the periodic part. And uh, let me just remind you of um, a few things. For instance, we argue that uh, this block Hamiltonian is periodic in momentum <coughs> space, where G are reciprocal lattice vectors. And uh, uh, so is this uh, uh, the, the block wave function, u n k plus g is u n k. So, so what 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 this implies is that k plus g is equal to, let me write it like this. We have to identify uh, k plus g with k, right? Because everything is periodic. And topologically, therefore, a uh, brillouin zone is a torus. sometimes denoted as t to power d. So for instance, in a two-dimensional system, Brillouin, say, square lattice, a Brillouin zone is just a, a square a domain in momentum space, right? kx, ky. <coughs> However, these two lines are identified, and these two lines are identified. So you can think of it as wrapped up into a torus uh, embedded in a three-dimensional space. And similarly, uh, in three dimensions, that uh, 3D torus is more difficult to uh, picture, but it's the same, same thing. So this is where uh, topology immediately enters. Um, what we have not discussed so far, and uh, this is uh, important for topological band theory, is that the Bloch equation can be made invariant 
under uh, the transformation, which is akin to a gauge transformation, <clears throat> under global transformation, I can simply send u k. And sometimes in the following, when I don't explicitly do anything with the band index, I will omit the <coughs> band index. It's understood that there may be many bands but I will focus on just one of them, e to the i phi times uk. And it's clear that if my uk is a solution of this equation, when I attach some constant phase to it, then that's going to be also a solution, just like uh, a Schrodinger equation. However, uh, one can... Uh, make this uh, global uh, symmetry into a local symmetry. So I can define a local symmetry. <clears throat> By making this phi k dependent, And uh, because uh, <clears throat> and, and, and because this equation is valid for each k separately, this is still a symmetry of uh, of that equation, and uh, um, this uh, motivates in uh, analogy with the gauge transformation in electricity of uh, electricity and magnetism. Uh, this motivates a uh, so, so this is reminiscent <coughs> of uh, EM gauge transformation. And this invites definition of the vector potential or sometimes called a Berry connection which I denote by a curly A which is a vector and it's a function of a of k in the Brillouin zone as minus i u k gradient with respect to k of uh, u of k in a product. Why is this so? Well. Under this type of uh, a gauge transform, under this type of transformation of the wave function, um, this guy transforms as a gauge field. Uh, let me call this one, and let me call this two. Under transformation two, it transforms. as uh, a k goes to a k plus gradient of k phi of k. And indeed, you can see that uh, that's the case. If I change uh, u by this k-dependent phase, then I have to take a gradient of that phase, and uh, this A will remain the same. <coughs> I insist that, uh, that um, 
uh, it's, it's shifted by the same gradient. Okay, so this looks, this starts looking uh, very much like um, uh, electricity and magnetism, but everything here depends in momentum space, right? So that's the important distinction. And uh, the, there's two questions that you can ask right now. Um, since this quantity here um, is uh, not gauge invariant, I can change it like this uh, by just redefining my wave function. Does it have any physical meaning? Right? And it turns out by itself it does, it does not, but you can construct a gauge invariant uh, quantity out of this that has a well-defined physical meaning, and we will study that in a moment. Um, and so the question is how to do this mathematically, and then second question, what sort of physical quantity can potentially this represent? So let's uh, study those questions. Um, okay, let me move here. So although A of K is gauge dependent, we may define a gauge invariant very phase like this gamma c is an integral <laughs> over a closed trajectory that we call c a dot dk and I'm now uh, specializing to a two-dimensional uh, Brillouin zone. And this can be written as integral over a surface area bounded by this curve C of uh, something like this, which we associate with the gauge flux. So I'm specializing. And, uh, yeah, so, so the examples of this that actually work physically are those in 1D and 2D. We will see how 1D works. There's also 3D topological phases, but there one has to construct a different uh, type of topological invariant. Yes? Oh, so is that the very curvature? Yeah, this F uh, is... Uh, um, the Berry curvature. So here, F is uh, basically a curl in momentum space of this A, and it's called the Berry curvature. And in order to, yeah, I, I have to write it like this. So F um, is the third component of this. So let's do it like this. Z dot it into a curl of A. And in two dimensions, this is well defined. Is something called the Berry curvature. So this quantity clearly is gauge invariant. Because if you take a uh, uh, if, if you take that quantity and you perform a gauge transformation, then an integral of this along a closed curve is uh, is uh, zero for a, a single valued uh, function phi. <coughs> Just like when in electricity and magnetism you take uh, uh, line integral over. A gauge potential over a closed line that corresponds to magnetic flux, and that's gauge invariant. Question? Uh, how, what, what motivates the definition of the Perry connection? 
uh, this property that the wave function is, uh, is uh, uh, invariant under that transformation. So it's exactly the same thing that, you know, when you study ordinary um, Schrodinger equation in electromagnetic fields, you also observe that the wave function has this property that uh, uh, you can attach to it a phase now dependent on real space variable, real space position. But then you also notice that in order for uh, the real Schrodinger equation in real space to be invariant under such transformation, you have to uh, define a gauge potential which transforms precisely like this uh, in uh, where you know, this would be a real space gradient. So this is a direct analogy of that. <coughs> So, um, and here comes the, uh, the first uh, interesting uh, topological invariant, which is also called the churn invariant. Also sometimes uh, called churn number. And uh, the churn number is simply defined as 1 over 2 pi times integral S F D 2 K. And it turns out when this S is a closed surface, this quantity is always an integer for any closed surface S. And this is a, a, a well-known theorem in mathematical physics, which I will not really prove here. Uh, but uh, let me give you a reference if you're interested. This is a well-known book that probably exists <clears throat> in this library here. If you're interested, you can look it up, or the original churn uh, papers that uh, would be cited in the book. <clears throat> so why is this important? Well, uh, like I said, in, uh, uh, say, two dimensions in uh, band theory, our Brillouin zone is, uh, is a torus which is a closed manifold, right, or closed surface. So um, if this uh, uh, Berry curvature is non-zero, or, well, we can always define it like this, right? And then this theorem tells us that this is always going to be integer, right? Now, if we can associate with this band curvature something physical, then, you know, this is a, a situation that we're looking for, something that... A, a physical quantity, measurable quantity, that is guaranteed to be quantized exactly. And uh, uh, this, in fact, is the underlying physics of uh, integer quantum Hall effect. Yes? This is still in 2D, right? This is, uh, yeah, I'm specializing to 2D now. And so what's meant precisely by closed surface? Oh, what, what, what's meant by closed surface is that uh, it's precisely what I have there. <clears throat> that you have um, uh, a manifold that, that is closed, that uh, you know, when I identify those two lines and these two lines, I have a closed manifold. So I can think about that as a, a torus embedded in a three-dimensional space. Right. So something that has periodic bound, that, that does not have any boundary. That's, that's the closed surface. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, so let me now give you a, 
uh, an example of, uh, of a case where uh, this type of uh, situation arises. So, so what I want to consider as an example is a two-level Hamiltonian that is a simplest system where one can see this type of non-trivial physics. And by two-level Hamiltonian, you, you, you could picture, for instance, a spin one-half. Right? Spin one-half is a two-level Hamiltonian. It can be up and down, uh, but we can write down uh, some more complicated uh, Hamiltonian. Or... Uh, we will see how this arises in, in, in solid state context in a Brillouin zone. Um, and the a general Bloch Hamiltonian with two levels can be written like this. So the sigma here will be uh, the vector of Pauli matrices. Sigma is uh, sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3. A sigma naught is a unit matrix. two by two unit matrix. And uh, let me just remind you of some, uh, some properties of uh, uh, Pauli matrices. You've seen this before. They mutually anti-commute. And uh, there is uh, another uh, useful uh, property that one can write down which is that the product of the two, sigma ij, is either equal to uh, the third one, epsilon ijk, sigma k, or if they are the same, it's equal to one. Right? So this is a useful property that uh, one can write down. And, and you, you probably saw that maybe not written in this compact form, but again, it just says that product of the two is either equal to one when they are the same, or if they are not the same, like sigma one times sigma two is i times sigma three. <coughs> OK. So um, let, let me just uh, analyze this Hamiltonian here. First of all, I will, from now on, neglect this part proportional to the unit matrix, because it has it, it affects the spectrum of the Hamiltonian, but it has no effect on the eigenstate, right? Because any uh, eigenstate is also an eigenstate of a unit matrix, right? Unit matrix just spits back the eigenstate. So uh, the, eigenst the form of the eigenstate is determined by this part, so I will, in, in what follows, neglect this. Although in physical examples, uh, this uh, might be of some importance, but for our consideration, this is not important. I can write this Hamiltonian explicitly as a two by two matrix just for concreteness. Let me do that. Um, so I have a DZ DX plus, sorry, minus IDY DX plus IDY minus DZ. And uh, if I didn't neglect this, then I would have epsilon and epsilon on the diagonal, but I'm not uh, uh, considering that. So this is the most general two by two Hermitian Hamiltonian. I cannot write anything more uh, general. And that's nice because uh, then I can analyze all the all possible two level systems in, in, one, uh, in one analysis. 
So let, let's first find the energy spectrum, which is easy. And the energy spectrum is most conveniently found by squaring the Hamiltonian. And uh, squaring the Hamiltonian, I can write it like this. So this is di sigma i times dj <coughs> sigma j, where I will implicitly assume summation over repeated indices. And uh, I can write this like so. I can take out di dj, because they commute with everything. di dj are just uh, uh, numbers. And uh, then I have sigma i, sigma j. These guys do not commute, so I should not permute them. And then I use this uh, relation here to see what, uh, uh, what this is. So I get di dj delta ij plus i epsilon ij k times sigma k. Okay. And uh, what I see here is that this is totally anti-symmetric tensor, which is now being contracted with something that is completely symmetric. So that will not give me any contribution. The only contribution I get <coughs> is when i is equal to j. And uh, this simply gives me d dotted into d. So the important thing about this Hamiltonian is that when I square it, uh, I just get a number which is equal to the length squared of this vector d. Okay? And that's simply because sigma's anti-commute. So when I'm squaring it, I get always, whenever I get sigma 1, sigma 2, I also get sigma 2, sigma 1. And they, they come with opposite signs, so they drop out. Anyway, the consequence of this is that my energy uh, squared k is d k squared, right? which allows me to read off uh, the energy spectrum itself by just taking a square root. And uh, I get two branches, which are simply the length of this vector d of k. And this, this will be a useful uh, formula in, in uh, what we, uh, what we in, in various applications. Okay, so now, how about this Berry's phase? So we found the spectrum. Now let's talk about Berry's phase. So Berry's phase, unfortunately, is not so easy uh, to derive. It's a bit technical. It's not too difficult, but I will not do it in a great detail. Basically, the way it proceeds is as follows. It is possible to find uh, the eigenstates corresponding to these uh, eigenvalues. Right? This is just a two by two matrix, so we know how to diagonalize it. And then one has to explicitly uh, calculate uh, that a of k, and uh, from that one can evaluate integrals <coughs> of this type. So you can you can imagine in, in your mind how this would go, but it would take me maybe two blackboards, and I don't think this is a very useful exercise to do on the blackboard. So in a regular long version of this course, I assign this as a homework, but I don't think we'll have time uh, for that either. So let me just tell you the result, which is uh, kind of simple and nice. So gamma c is simply equal to 1 half of omega, where this omega is uh, the solid angle swept by d of k. Okay? And this d of k is simply defined as a unit vector in the direction of uh, dk. So it's d of k divided by its amplitude. And uh, you can picture the space uh, of these d's. 
as a, a surface of a sphere in three dimensions because this has two components, right? And as we, uh, as we uh, go along some uh, contour C in momentum space, then this D of K traces some contour. So this is D of K. As I move uh, along some trajectory in the momentum space, then in the Hamiltonian, this uh, traces some contour on the surface. And this says here that the Berry's phase acquired uh, along that trajectory is a solid angle swept by this, uh, uh, this, this unit vector. Okay, one, one can show that, but like I said, it's a bit technical. So I will not really uh, go through that. Uh, calculation. Um, the important thing is that, that we can glean uh, from here, and, and, and I will emphasize that as we go, um, gamma c is only defined for a gapped phase. By which I mean that uh, d of k is greater than zero, okay? And and this is simply because when uh, uh, d of k at some point in momentum space would go to zero, then I cannot really define this unit vector. I would have zero <coughs> in the denominator. Unit vector does uh, sorry, a vector of zero length does not have a direction. So uh, this this Berry phase is really only well-defined for gapped uh, Hamiltonian. If there is some, some points or lines in this Hamiltonian when uh, this d goes to zero, then this, this Berry phase cannot really be uniquely defined, and therefore it cannot have a, a, um, a unique, uh, it cannot have a unique um, uh, physical meaning. Any questions about this? OK. There's a very useful formula that one can actually uh, write down to calculate this, uh, this, uh, this gamma uh, C, uh, or the, the Berry curvature. And this is also uh, shown in this uh, Nakahara book. And it's something that, again, I will not prove. So in, for this case, that, that I just described, this F can be defined as uh, one half epsilon ij d dotted into partial i d cross partial j. Okay, so I have a three dimensional unit vector d here. And if I want to calculate this uh, uh, gamma, I can do that through this formula. And we will use that formula when we actually want to calculate this uh, uh, Berry uh, curvature. Question? Can you explain again what you mean by swept by dk? Uh, swept means uh, simply what's drawn here. So, so, as, uh, so I have a Brillouin zone. Right, so this is the Brillouin zone. And uh, I choose some trajectory in this Brillouin zone that is this trajectory C. So this is momentum space K, X, K, Y. Uh, th there is some trajectory C that I uh, oriented trajectory C in the Brillouin zone along which I want to integrate this. As I, as I go along this trajectory in the Brillouin zone, that corresponds to some path here in, uh, uh, on this unit sphere in D. And I'm looking at the total uh, solid angle that is swept by this trajectory. Okay? In other words, uh, it would be, if this is a unit sphere, the, the surface of a unit sphere is 4 pi. And this angle omega is simply the, this area here, which I may call d divided by 4 pi. You haven't yet specified the dimensionality of the 
Well, I'm now specializing to two dimensions for simplicity. So my Brillouin zone is two dimensional. OK, so this much for uh, mathematics. Let's uh, uh, discuss some physics. So here's a, a one-dimensional example. And in one dimension, one can show that uh, this, uh, this Berry phase actually is uh, related to polarization of a one-dimensional system. So let me remind you about uh, polarization. Electric polarization in electricity and magnetism, denoted by capital P, is defined simply as dipole moment per unit volume. OK. So specifically in 1D, right, in a 1D system, we have a of positively charged ions, right? And then we have electrons in some, some wave functions like this. And in each unit cell, we can define a dipole moment, right? It might be zero when, um, you know, if these were just basically a bunch of neutral atoms, then uh, a uh, dipole moment of each atom typically would be zero, so polarization would be zero. But you can imagine that this negative charge is shifted with respect to uh, the, the respective ion. For instance, the wave function uh, of the electron can, look, can be skewed. It can look like this. It can be kind of bunched up. And then, in this case, th there would be a net dipole moment, uh, D, let me, capital D, in each, uh, in each unit cell. And the, the bulk here would remain neutral because all I'm doing, I'm just shifting my electron charge density with respect to ion lattice. But what would then uh, this result to is that if I have a finite chain, uh, if, if I shift all my electrons here, I would have some excess of uh, a charge on one end, which I would call Q end. And on the other side, I would have a positive charge Q. And here, because again, the electron cloud has shifted uh, to the left, uh, sorry, to the right here. And this uh, is uh, uh, mathematically, uh, th there's a distinction between uh, bulk so-called bound charges And they are called uh, usually rho b, and given by minus gradient, uh, sorry, minus divergence of polarization. And the uh, surface charge which is uh, denoted by sigma b, and this is given by p dotted into n, where n is the surface normal. So this is valid in any uh, dimension. I, I drew a one-dimensional example there, uh, but um, this is valid in any dimension. So once again, in 1D, that's the case I want to consider here. In 1D, I will have a a neutral bulk, but uh, I will have some surface charge. And let me be consistent. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I will consider electron charge as positive. So this is plus 
and uh, this is minus like this. Um, so I would have minus q n here and plus q n. Okay. So with this preparation, the main uh, point that I want to make is that this uh, polarization is actually directly related to uh, the Berry phase. And uh, the, the relation is actually quite, uh, uh, quite simple. So this is called a modern theory of polarization. Modern th theory of polarization says that uh, P is equal to E over 2 pi times sum over all occupied bands <coughs> integral over the Brillouin zone A K Now I'm writing here uh, a closed integral because Brillouin zone in this case is a circle, right? It's a line, but I identify its ends, so it's actually <coughs> an integral over a closed contour. And uh, this A of k um, is defined as previously uh, over there by the same definition. Now. Notice the, <clears throat> the following. <clears throat> so, so, you know, I, I just write this formula and I, I will give you a, a, a simple proof. But, um, so you may think, so what? I mean, this is just some polarization and a quantity I maybe don't care about so much. And I related it to some Berry phase that maybe I don't care about either. So what was the big deal? Well, this is kind of interesting for the following reason. Notice that uh, this um, um, Berry phase is defined through the, the Bloch wave functions. And these Bloch wave functions are defined for periodic boundary conditions, right? They, I, I, I'm solving, whenever I, I, I have momentum, I'm assuming that I have either infinite system or I have finite system with periodic boundary conditions. So this quantity is calculated for an infinite system or system with periodic boundary conditions. And nevertheless, this polarization gives me this surface charge through this formula, which pertains to an open-ended system. Right? So um, this is important because what this is telling us is that I can calculate. So, so, so I calculate this. Uh, this uh, uh, Berry curvature for a ring with periodic boundary conditions that does not have any ends. Nevertheless, this uh, Berry phase tells me about what happens when I, when I come, cut this ring, straighten it out, and it tells me that potentially I can have a, a charge at the end. So this is the, the deep thought here. And it's sometimes also called bulk boundary correspondence. In high energy physics, sometimes this is called holography. This is a kind of uh, uh, poor man's version of holography, where um, what's, what's happening in the bulk really determines what's going on on the surface. And you can calculate the bulk property without any reference to the surface. Yes? I just asked about the drawing you made there with the red chalk. The, with wood. Yes. I just didn't uh, quite catch. OK, it's a messy drawing, and I apologize for this. So what I'm trying to represent here is that uh, you have some positively charged ions, which just form a lattice. right? And then you can ask, what are the electrons doing? And they are in some, uh, th this, this 
messy drawing here is a drawing of electron density, right? You have some electron cloud. And it can be such that uh, there is no dipole moment in a unit cell. Like if you had a neutral atoms, just a bunch of neutral atoms just lined up, that would have no uh, dipole moment. However, I can have a solid where Hamiltonian is such that all these uh, electron clou clouds are shifted to one side of the Bruin zone. Uh, sorry, to one side of the unit cell, right? And that's what's meant to be drawn by this red line, right? So I'm trying to draw it somewhat skewed to one side, and I didn't quite succeed. So what then happens is that the bulk is, of course, still neutral because I'm just shifting the negative charge in the bulk. I'm not adding anything in. However, at the end, I will suddenly see that I have some, some charge at the end that is not compensated, and, and it's only compensated on the other end. And so the important idea here is that uh, if this is true, and it is, then uh, these uh, uh, surface charges Q end uh, is determined by bulk topology. So, uh, and, and for that reason, uh, one expects this surface charge to be robust, right? If it's determined by what's happening in the bulk, then when, when you add some, some, some potential at the end or some impurities or something, you don't expect uh, this to change. And indeed, uh, this is the case. And that's why uh, we're, we're interested in, in this type of physics, that it is the bulk that um, uh, gives us uh, uh, some property at, uh, at the surface. OK, so uh, let me sketch a quick proof of, uh, of this statement. The detailed proof is kind of long, and I, I will just give you a, a quick proof. Yes? Is that the one-dimensional example you mentioned that you come to at the end of the Yeah, lecture? this is a one-dimensional example. So for the proof, um, proof introduces a, a concept of one year function. Which, which are known in, in condensed matter <coughs> physics. They are uh, maximally localized orbitals that one can write. And uh, for our purposes, their uh, usefulness will be uh, as follows. So we define this Vanier function as, uh, as follows. It's an integral over one-dimensional Brillouin zone dk of e to i k r minus r of u n k r. So this is the periodic part of the Bloch wave function. And I multiply it by e to the i k r minus some fixed position, which can be a position, typically would be a position of an ion. And uh, the Vanier wave function is an integral over all momenta k of uh, uh, that combination. And it turns out, and I will not prove that, and this is a part of the whole story, that uh, this uh, Vanier wave function is uh, uh, something that is localized in real space rather than in momentum space. So uh, let me just uh, uh, make a sketch. So if this is my one-dimensional ionic lattice, d 
these are ions, my uh, u of k is a function with periodicity of the lattice, right? So this is my u and k of r. If I drew it better, it, you would see that it has a periodicity of the lattice. On the other hand, if I denote this guy by r, this particular ion, then I can show that this uh, Vanier function is actually localized near uh, this ion. So this is uh, W and R minus R. Okay, that's the important thing. <clears throat> so now these are useful <coughs> because when I want to calculate this very phase, uh, it's uh, actually going to be well defined. Um, so what I now do, I write the inverse transformation. This is just the Fourier transform, right? So uh, the inverse looks like this. Un kr is 1 over square root of n, the sum over r, e2 minus i k r minus capital R w n r minus r. And you can check that this works. Just substitute this in there, perform the integral, and you would find that uh, you get w equals w. So this is the inverse. And uh, now what I want, I want to prove that uh, this polarization is equal to that. So I evaluate this right-hand side using, uh, using the definition of A. And uh, Berry phase is defined through these periodic functions. And I will express them through Vanier functions. And I will tell you why this is a good thing to do. So A of K is minus I 1 over N sum over r, r prime, e to d. Oh, I still have a integral dr over the unit cell. This comes from the inner product, e to the i k r minus r minus i Okay, so, so remember this uh, A of K is given as an inner product of UN with the gradient of UN, right? And what I'm doing, I'm simply uh, substituting for UN this, uh, this uh, expansion. And then I can easily take a gradient or derivative with respect to K because it only appears here in the exponential. So that's what I did when I take a derivative of this. I get this uh, downstairs, right? And now I can actually calculate this. Uh, for instance, this guy drops against that guy. And uh, the important thing is that, um, uh, you see, since these uh, Vanier wave functions are localized near a site, this is actually a bounded integral, although when I integrate over this r and sum over r prime, this uh, uh, would grow. Since I have these uh, bounded wave functions, actually, this integral is finite. If I attempt to just uh, do it through the, these periodic functions, that property would not be clear. So this is a kind of uh, uh, a tricky way, but uh, um, it works. So. Uh, 
Anyway, so now I have to uh, calculate this uh, polarization. <coughs> I take this and I stick it into uh, that formula over there. And what I get is the following P over NA sum over all occupied bands sum over all R integral over unit cell dr and this is r minus r times wn r minus r squared and what happened here is that that formula involves integral over all k which i can perform because k just appears here and uh, integral dk just gives me the usual 1 over a times delta r r prime, then I perform a summation over r prime, and I end up with this relation. Uh, now, I just have to combine these two guys. So this is the sum over all lattice sites, and this is a sum, this is an integral over just the unit cell. So when I put that together, I can write this as simply E over L, which is n times a, sum over all occupied bands. And this is just an integral dr, r times w n of r squared. And indeed, uh, this uh, is a, a dipole moment per unit length, or a polarization in 1D. So the reason why this is just a kind of sketch of a proof is that one still has to prove that you know, th these Vanier functions, these integrals, are finite. And this is not completely trivial. But uh, yeah, in, in modern theory of polarization, this is actually uh, proven. So indeed, uh, one can show that uh, in one, the uh, polarization is uh, given by, uh, is related directly to this Berry phase. So Berry phase is not just a useless quantity that we have defined, but has a physical manifestation. Um, OK. I think I will stop here, because the next thing uh, I cannot really finish in five minutes. So this is all for today. We continue with some more concrete examples tomorrow. And uh, um, I see you then.